Hello everyone and welcome to the Grumpy Surfer podcast. I'm the Grumpy Surfer and your host Ads Lyson. So before we start, I have a 10% discount code for anyone that wants to use the Ombi Surf programs. I've been using them for the last six to eight months. Amazing. Improved my surfing, no end. My rail turns, my flow and the way I'm actually surfing and feeling when I'm doing it is absolutely fantastic. So if you would like to receive your 10% code, go to ombe, O-M-B-E dot co forward slash ref forward slash grumpy surfer. And you go select the uh, 12 week program, which is amazing, but they've also got loads of other stuff like surf skating, the cardboard surfer, how to choose a surfboard, lots and lots of Amazing information from uh, Clayton and Amber and also Anthony Lay. Right, this podcast is split into two. My guest this week is a South African surfer, a former Royal Marines commando officer, former maritime security and oil security person, I guess you could call them, but has also now set up his own online security program that stops people sending phishing emails to major corporations and businesses. So, please enjoy part one of my conversation with Dan Thornton. Dan Thornton, welcome to the podcast for the second time. Ed, thanks very much for having me, mate. Good to be here. All right. Three questions again. How are you? Where are you? And have you served today? Uh, I'm doing well, keeping nice and busy. Uh, I am in Cape St. Francis on the east coast of uh, South Africa. And unfortunately, I haven't surfed today. Things have been busy, waves haven't been too great, but uh, otherwise keeping well. Yeah, so the reason why I said again at the start of this was I pulled out a mega novice error there, for those of you listening. And uh, I didn't press record when we started, <laughs> which was which is a bit shocker than my behalf. Have you uh, got any... Decent swells coming through at the moment? Um, nothing yet. Nothing yet. We're keeping our eye on the, on the charts. You know, the, this time of year, May, June time, we start, start to get into winter, start to see some nice swells sort of turning up, some nice cold fronts. But we haven't had anything in a couple of weeks now. Uh, about a month ago, we had some some nice swells hit hit the east coast um we had bruce's beauties really nice had a few decent waves at uh, at supers and j bay um but otherwise yeah it's been a slow start to the season and hopefully things will kick off nicely yeah it's a bit weird because considering we're on the same timeline i know like you know you, you're in the southern hemisphere down your way but we're coming into the summer season here and you're you're going back into winter which always it always kind of is a bit weird for me. I don't know how it works. I need to look into geography a little bit more, I think. Yeah, I, I wish I had the bucks to chase winters around or summers around, you know, just ch- chasing chasing storms, ch- chasing chasing different winter swells would be a pretty good pastime. I just need the bucks and the spare time, I guess. Well, a mutual friend of ours, Nick Christie, seems to be doing all right for himself, doesn't he? Bombing around with uh, Geordie Smith. Yeah, he's in Margaret's now. I got, got videos and messages from him yesterday. They're getting some nice waves there. Well, when I was doing a bit of research on you know, the last last couple of days, I pulled up that um, that uh, RVCA um, sort of like little edit he did on you what a couple of years ago now. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it was a nice little little edit he did. Yeah, Nick's Nick's doing really well on the on the the video front. He's uh, he's built a really good brand for himself. He's yeah, you know, he's got some mad mad video skills, and it's paying off. I mean, he's traveling around on the tour now. He's 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 the first he's the first guy from our group to make it on tour. <laughs> yeah, he's like the he's like the only non sponsored surfer photographer that that isn't actually physically on your TV screen, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's he's doing well. Um, yeah, they've got a they've had a great year so far traveling at some really really good waves. Um, but yeah, he's he should be. Yeah, he's gonna get he's gonna get back to back to SA in about about two weeks, I think. Yeah. I've told him that he's next on my hit list. I've been after him for a few months, but he keeps dodging my messages every time I say that I want him on the podcast. Yeah, well, he, he just got scooped up in a little little local local newspaper that a story on him. All the boys took the piss. Oh, um, did they? So yeah, 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 for sure. So yeah, you definitely got to get him on the podcast. Oh, mate, wicked. Well, the reason why I got you on is there's sort of like a bit of backstory um, to us, really. 
is we we joined up round about around about the same time and uh i remember coming off the back of um optelic optelic yeah optelic when i got drafted down from uh four five commando down to four two commando um one of my friends freddie warwick a good friend of mine said that the have you heard of a guy called dan thornton you know he's a surfer and uh when your name got thrown out there i was trying to chase you down and try and get in touch with you. I mean, mobile phones were kind of like a new thing around then, so no one really had anybody else's number. I didn't have a mobile phone, I don't think. So ever since like I've, you know, been been on the uh, the Navy surf team sort of scene, I've been trying to track you down because, you know, this is the reason why I got you on here is that you've got a, a, a very interesting, and I think a very unique story, even though you probably don't think so, uh, to tell really um which i which i think is quite unique yeah man it was it was a shame we we missed each other at, at four five and and kind of missed each other d- during our time in the in the call but yeah the the navy surf team the the elusive the the elusive navy surf team that's yeah they're one of the luckiest groups of guys are out there i mean some of the funding you guys you, you would be able to tap into and some of the the surf trips and the contests and the get togethers it wasn't something i i ever really was able to take maximum advantage of but geez they've they're putting a really good thing together there they must be pretty proud of, of what they've done there with the navy surf team and they must keep that going I think it's like a lot of things, especially within the forces. Well, especially from the Marines and Navy side, is sometimes it can be seen as like quite clicky. Um, but it's very a lot of the a lot of the teams and clubs are very unlike that. It's I think because we're quite non-emotional and very black and white kind of people that it can probably be seen that way a little bit. Um, unless you actually turn up and you put the time in and you get to know people, that's when you really start getting to the niche of things. Yeah, and, and I think surfing as a sport kind of leaves everything else at the door. It doesn't matter, you know, what rank you are or where you live or what unit you're in. You know, everyone's everyone's kind of equal in the water. Everyone's going to get their ass kicked on a big day, so it doesn't really matter. And and afterwards, everyone coming together around a fire and sharing some beers. I mean, it it really leaves leaves egos and and leaves you know all of that at the door. So, yeah, I'm, I I would have liked to have spent a lot more time getting involved there during my time. As a shame. I think what I'd like to do is just go back and we'll talk a little bit about your background and a little bit about your history as well. So, can you just tell everyone? Um, where you grew up and how you got into surfing. So cool. Um, I grew up in the Eastern Eastern Cape, South Africa, um, a little town called Jeffrey's Bay. Um, went to school there, learned to surf. Um, my old man was a surfer. So I think I was, I was in the water from about six or seven years old. Um, started competing, little, little contests, um, probably around from the age of sort of 10 or 11. Um, sort of provincial provincial level in in south africa um and then you know competed all through school in in sort of lo- local provincial and, and national national contest at the time we were super lucky sort of my my sort of era of surfers in south africa there was a huge contest scene and big sponsors and you know grommet surfing in sa growing up when i was coming up was insane it was uh pushed by all of the big brands you know we were away every weekend at different surf contests and different away weekends and we, we got brought up in the in the board riders surf clubs as well there was a huge surf club scene in each of the different towns um so we you know as grommets we got brought up in in that sort of community which was which was epic um a lot of, lot of big surfers you know a lot of big names sort of coming out of out of sa you know during that time Jordy Smith, Ricky Bassnett, you know, a lot of guys that have done super well, Sean Holmes, Greg Emsley. Um, so yeah, it was it was a super time to come up in the schools. Um, and we competed at a school level as well. You know, the the high schools, you know, high school that I was at in in SA, we'd go off to the South African uh, schools champs every year and used to compete there, we used to win every year because our school had all the surfers from J Bay and St. Francis. So we used to smoke guys around the country which was cool but yeah it was a it was a good place to grow up um a lot of freedom growing up as a grommet freedom to surf freedom to to cruise around you know little surf gangs surf clubs yeah it was a it was a good time there's a mutual friend of ours uh, scott ranikin and uh 
we were talking about programs and how surfing has developed from probably you know our era uh, growing up where it was pretty much like you watched some uh, vhs's you know of the pros and stuff and that's kind of like how you emulated and you developed your style and and had kind of learned about technique I mean, from your perspective, was that very similar to the way that you were competing and how you how you learned how to do things and uh, and different maneuvers on waves? Oh yeah, I mean, we 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 grew up in the era where you watch VHS VHS tapes until they fell apart. You know, the, all the Billabong, all the Billabong videos and the the focus and momentum videos. You know, we we were that generation where we'd get our wetsuits on stick a tape in the in in the tv and 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 watch a quick video to amp up for your surf and then run off down to the beach and, and go surf it out so yeah we we'd spent there was there was no social media when we were coming up we spent all our time just watching surf videos and getting amped to surf um and the surf clubs were a big deal as well you know just coming together in big gangs of kids and and hanging out on the beach in a big group of kids nobody had phones nobody was giving a shit about likes or posts or any crap like that it was who could catch the most waves you know who who could get the 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 best surfing done on that day that was the sort of focus as as kids which is cool i think there's a big cultural sort of um outlook on this really because if you look at the the surf scene in the uk to places like you know south africa and australia is i think the reason why you don't get as many people in the clubs and and being consistent with lots of competitions is purely for the fact of the weather here is so inclement you know you probably get three or four months of the year potentially that are above like 15 degrees but below 25 um, but the rest of the time it's either rain and it's cold or you know you've got off onshore winds northerlies or southerlies and they're normally like super super strong um, just blowing everything out so the consistency of of actual waves around here is 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 far and few between sometimes i mean don't get me wrong we 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 do get the the good run every now and again as as you full well know but you know when you're in a a, a, a country like like you for instance where you know the predominant you know weather patterns there are, are warm um same as australia you can have those times on the beach and it's a you know it's it's not two or three months it's like you know six to eight months of the year which i think plays a big part in it as well yeah for sure and and i mean it's just the position of where we are and how crazy our coastline is and and you know the the storms that we have coming out of the deep atlantic and then coming out of the indian ocean you know there's so many there's so many options there's always waves there's always swell we've got such a crazy big coastline that's exposed to all of it and there's always somewhere to surf the the wind is always good somewhere um and you know we've we've also got a good sort of history of of surfers and surf culture for whatever reason and that that sort of helped the grommets come up over generations and hope you know, help bring in the contest culture and the and the club culture as well. So, yeah, we we've, we've been pretty lucky in in South Africa. I mean, the the problem, the one problem that we do have is is you know difficulty for travel. You know, we we're on the arse end of the dark continent, so getting anywhere decent is is pretty pretty tough. It's it's long to travel, and the South African Rand definitely doesn't go as far as the Sterling is these days. So, you know, with is is definitely there's profs and dips, as they say. Yeah, we were talking about that 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 sort of um comparison between travel and uh and, and and actually scoring waves and you know you you said to me do, do you go and surf wales that much and i was like well you know it's you know two or three hours from my house where you know if, if you're traveling anywhere from your local break it probably takes you two or three hours to go and score those waves and there's me dripping on a little island here when you're on the probably one of the biggest continents in the world and you've got to travel to do that yeah, exactly. But I mean, yeah, the, the funny thing is you, you say that, but there's, you know, when big swells hit South Africa and, you know, we anticipate these swells like 10 days out, two weeks out, everyone starts frothing for the big swell coming. Everyone starts planning their move and where they're going to go and where they're going to chase. You know, we, we nine times out of 10 end up staying at home and surfing our local point breaks because, you know, you, you wait all year for them to turn on. So, but then there's, there's good opportunities as well. You know, the guys have been surfing, uh, Namibia, you know, the, 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 the good left, left banks there, you know, over the last few years, they've been surfing like skeleton, um, 
let me get a good waves there. The guys will chase chase swells up to Mozambique and go surf big cyclone swells up in Mozambique. Um, warm water, right handers. So yeah, there's there's a lot of options. And then I mean, our, our coast is we're pretty spoiled in South Africa with waves from the west coast up, you know, up from Cape Town all the way to to Durban and all the all the reefs and and beach breaks in Durban as well. So yeah, we're pretty pretty blessed, pretty lucky. Is there a lot of those pilgrim pilgrimage trips that people go on? Is it is it quite a common thing? And and uh, what I guess what's the safety like as well? Because when you're going out of South Africa and places like Mozambique and Namibia, you're kind of going into into lots of different cultures that not potentially their political situation aren't really that stable, really. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, coming out of South Africa, you don't get too much worse than South Africa. No, I, I think suppose our so. crime rates, <laughs> yeah, our, our, our crime rates are as, as bad as it gets. So, you know, you're, you're only going to move to, to a safer place. Now, Namibia is Namibia's super low-key. Like, Namibia, the, the crime rates, the risk in Namibia is, is you know, minuscule, probably similar to, to the UK even, right? So, but no, the the movement, I mean, the guy's going to the surf the donkey when that turns on and the swell direction's right and the waves are right and and the the sand is right there. It's huge. They they self out flights going from Cape Town to 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 Namibia. Um with just packed with surfers getting up there. Um, I mean, even international surfers flying in from as far as Hawaii chasing swells to to the donkey have been insane. So, I mean, that that wave's a, a phenomenon all on its own that the guys have really been tapping into over the last few years. Um, but yeah, but the water's the water's cold and the wave goes in the wrong direction for me as well, coming from J Bay. But then on the on the flip side of it, you know, when a big cyclone comes in from the Indian Ocean and smacks into Madagascar and smashes into into Mozambique, the guys will chase cyclone swells up to Mozam as well. So, and that's that's beautiful. You know, it's it's also an you know African country. Um, you know, there's there's a bit of risk there. Definitely not as much crime as South Africa. A bit of corruption. You know, always always having to pay off the the local cops to get through and avoid fines and stuff. But you know, once you get to the surf spot and you get to the camp there, you can just park off surf cooking waves for days on end. Water is super, super warm. It's tropical conditions, white sand, blue, blue water. It's it's a really, really good surf destination, Mozambique, actually. You should be part of the tourist trade. You should be trying to sell <laughs> holidays, mate. That was almost like a like a massive plug there. <laughs> yeah, you need to get down. Come and join us. Mate, I would I would love to. So I've got, I've got like well, it's it's a miserable story from my point of view, but uh, it's quite funny really. So I, I went on a surfing trip to to Portugal a few years back, and um, again the Navy surf team they they'd organised to go to South Africa. They come down to stay in Jeffers Bay. So I thought I tell you what, I'm going to go and do this Portugal trip. The South Africa one came up a couple of months after, and I thought, do you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to put all my eggs into one basket and just keep asking for these chips because my missus is going to go nuts and she's going to be absolutely threaders with me, um, like keep going away. So I didn't, I didn't ask her, kind of sucked it up. The previous year I'd been to Morocco and the Maldives in the same year. So that's kind of why I didn't really, you know, put that one on the table. And then about two months before the guys were going out to South Africa, I just you know, casually mentioned, oh, by the way, um, you know, the guys are getting ready to go out to South Africa. And she said, why aren't you going? And I went, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was, I was so angry with myself. It was unbelievable. No, I see. Oh, I, geez, Morocco's good. Hey, that's, that's somewhere I've only, only been over once. And I mean, that, that place gets insane. Those right-hand point breaks there are, are like J Bay. They're like South African point breaks. It's, pretty pretty epic and the water's pretty warm and the people are super cool it's it's a really really cool destination i'd love to get back there um i did a trip there geez, maybe 10 years ago um we, we went there with a small team of guys um flew in surfed surfed all the main points in in morocco and then we we actually got some four by fours got some camping gear and we drove south into the western sahara and just off like Google Maps and, and maps that we had, we went and investigated all these different point breaks. 
and just no one down there. Literally just driving to the end of a dirt track, setting up camp on the beach, surfing a little point break for a couple of days, and then chasing the next little swell down the coast. We went all the way to the bottom um, of the Western Sahara and then uh, and then drove back up against Morocco. Crazy trip, but yeah, beautiful part of the world. Mate, that's the dream for me at the moment. I'm, uh, I've got a couple of weeks left, so by the time this podcast comes out, actually the Monday it comes out, I have physically left the military on the Saturday, so um, yeah, that's going to be going to be one of my, uh, I guess, not bucket lists because I'm going to do it. Uh, it's to get out to Morocco and, and go down into the Sahara. Don't know who's coming. I'll end up going on my own. Probably just get lost in translation, like uh, the Machado film, The Drifter, where I just disappear yeah. into the ether. So, yeah, I, I'd love to do something like that too. I've I've done you know boat trips and stuff like that, but. You know, I think there's something about just going off the beaten track a little bit and, and not having magic seaweed or, you know, these spot maps. You know, remember the Storm Riders guides where they used to tell you like where to go, what conditions, what the yeah, tide yeah. needs to be like. You know, it's just going out there and just and just kind of sitting there and listening and watching and waiting and just kind of seeing for yourself and discovering new things that, you know, and being on your own as well, really. Yeah. Have you have you got a camper van, if, or you, you're gonna you, you're gonna stay in in hostels or B and Bs, or what, what's what's your plan? Uh, I haven't got a plan yet. <laughs> nice, good. But probably yeah. just well, I, when I used to go to Bali, what I used to do is I just used to take a day sack with um with, with a jungle sleeping bag and a cup a, a couple of spare bits of clothes. Yeah, and uh, and just carrying my board with me, and then I'd go and stay in these proper cheap shitty little places that cost me a couple of pounds a night with a shower was literally like a tap that was just above head high and you turn it on and and that was it and uh, i i spent you know three or four years just just traveling around indo you know java um around the bucket and other little places that you wouldn't necessarily go as a tourist and uh it was pretty cool and i kind of did that on my own as well and just met some some nice people uh, on the way and you know just discovered you know new things really yeah, Indo is pretty fun. I'm looking forward to getting back there. I haven't been back there now in two years, obviously with with COVID now. But they they're open back up, and yeah, you know, looking forward to getting back there. Shame, I think they've been hit pretty hard tourism wise, like during COVID and the shutdown and everything. So yeah, it'll be good to get back there. Yeah, I, I did a I did a little trip down to uh, down to Guam in September. I was uh, I was lucky enough to go out there and do some surf coaching, and uh, me and me and one of the friends, Andy, we, we jumped in with the uh, with the Navy Adventure Training guys, and uh, we were hoping to score some waves out there. So we took a couple of mid lengths out, managed to score about you know four days of yeah three to four foot really nice waves, um, razor sharp coral out there though. It's like I was kicking out in some of them and I was like clipping my toes on the top of it and he was just like ripping the skin off the top. And I was like, yeah. oh my God, how do people surf this? Like eight to 10 foot. You get smashed on that. It hurt, man. And, and were, there, were there some good good surfers out there? Oh, yeah. And it was, um, it was a little, was it localized? It was a little bit localized because the Guam itself is only 30 miles by 15 wide. Um, it's, it's not a particularly a big place. It was one of the places that the Americans had to fight through, um, through, uh, through the Pacific campaign, um, to, to move up towards Japan. Um, so there's loads of war memorial stuff around there that, that's pretty interesting to look into. And sometimes you stand on some of those war memorials and it paints a picture of what that battlefield was like in front of you. And like, how the fuck did people survive in this? It was, a, it was, a, it was immense. But yeah, scored scored some nice waves, and once you know the the locals realised that we weren't there to take every single wave, which you know a few few other I call them Westerners, you know, uh, Americans and Brits probably did to annoy them. They were super fine with it. And the and the the American surf contingent because they've still got quite a big base out there, don't they? Yeah, there's a lot of expats out there. So there's two major bases out there. There's a um, the, there's an American Air Force base on the north of yeah. the island and a naval base on the southern, on the southern side. So the the actual um, the actual island itself is kind of like a, it's it's not a state. It's kind of an American territory. Um, so it's kind of like that 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 midway point before be, between America and you know the the eastern um, side of the continent, really. Yeah, 
Yeah, I haven't been. I haven't. I haven't really done anything out in that part of the world. I've kind of spent 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 most of my time surfing around Europe, surfing sort of Indian Ocean stuff, and but yeah, I'd, I'd love to love to start venturing out that way a little bit. Yeah, to be honest with you, it, the the island itself is kind of like a um, a tourist destination for the South Koreans and and the Japanese. But okay, what, it, it, I don't want to slag it off because it's like a super nice place, but. A lot of the hotels kind of looked a little bit run down, you know, where the, like the paint's peeling off the side of the of the walls and stuff. But, you know, on the flip side of that kind of what do you expect? You've got an island that's, you know, 30 miles circumference in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And uh, I'm dripping about a little bit of paint on some hotels. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and did you did you fly out there, you know, courtesy, courtesy of the Corps and, and yeah. in, in, in military aircraft? No, no. So it was it was all civilian paid. So okay. within, the, within the military now, we've got um, adventure training plays a big part of it. And they've got a, a naval adventure training team that goes out. So the reason why we we're out there is the uh, carrier strike group uh, with the Queen Elizabeth and, and the support and shipping uh, was out in the Pacific. Um, so we were just going out there because basically they hadn't been off ship for a long time and there was a few issues going on there. So uh, we, we did some surf coaching out there. Um, there was some SUP and climbing, co-steering, just some cool stuff just, just to get them off, you know, getting off ship and just going to the shore and just getting that absolutely smashed on the piss. Awesome. And, and, how, and how was the nightlife there? Pretty decent? Uh, yeah, it was all right, I guess. It was kind of like uh, partly like a, a lower key island, Thailand and... A little bit like Bali, okay. um, but the whole island is is westernized. You know, I'm painting the picture like it's something out of Vietnam. It, it's it's <laughs> not it's not at all. You know, uh, everybody out there speaks uh, American English. Okay. So yeah, it's uh, it's a pretty cool place. If you end, ever end up getting going over there or just stopping off there, it's. But um, I wouldn't exactly say it's like a, a tourist destination to go. Yeah. No, I'd, I'd like to, yeah, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to get over Fiji way. I'd love to do Tahiti. Um, oh, I'd love to get like bucket list as P pass. I'd love to get to P pass in um, where where is it? The Caroline Islands is it the Caroline Islands. Yeah, I think I think the I've Caroline. Heard of it. Islands. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love, love. I've done nothing in the Pacific, but I, I've never been to Hawaii either. I'd love to get over to to Kauai and and go do some go do some surfing, go do some jets, go do some hunting. I think it'd be a top destination for for guys who sort of mix it up and and do do lots. You know, I'd love to get there. Just going back a little bit, so when you were uh, when you were younger before you joined the military, you know, what were you doing as a, a as a job to, to sort of like pay the way so you could. Uh, go on these surf trips and and compete as well D did you have anything interesting going on um not really hey i mean my parents made me made me get a job just to pay for the odd surfboard and and you know a bit of pocket money here and i i worked in one of the local surf shops you know just causing more trouble than anything else um you know, ho holiday jobs earning a bit of cash um but yeah i didn't didn't really do anything other than that so no, i finished finished school in 99 and as soon as i finished i went i went traveling packed the bags grabbed the passport and and headed off to europe to uh to st start doing some some traveling try and figure out what the hell i wanted to do with my life because I, I had no idea i didn't i knew i didn't want to study um i just i needed to go out and explore a little bit and kind of figure figure out what i wanted to do so i headed he headed off to the uk and then sort of started exploring europe from there so what on earth made you want to join the royal marine commandos and let alone the royal marine commandos as an officer yeah, so funny story. I, I actually, I, I had no idea. I mean, I was kind of bouncing from different jobs. I, like my first job, as soon as I got over there, I was um, I was a surf instructor on the west coast of Ireland for, for a little center there, which was fun. You know, I got to live in Ireland for six months as a kid. Um, I then went and did a ski season in the French Alps. I was a barman there, which was super fun. Got to learn to snowboard and spent a whole season up there, which was pretty cool. Um, and then 
yeah, I got back to the UK and I, I actually ended up pissing up in a pub with a couple bootnecks one night randomly. I think they they were they were in Croyd um, on a run ashore, ended up pissing up learning all about everything I needed to know about the core I learned in the pub that night. <laughs> and the the next the next day I went and, and signed up. And um I went in and and the you know in the recruitment office there, you know, I said, no, I want to join up. And they said, well, you know, what education have you got? What's your background? You know, and then I was and they're like, well, you know, you you could join up as an officer. I was like, no thanks, not for me. That sounds lame. And they're like, no, we recommend you know that that you you sign up as an officer and it'll be a better experience and you'll get this. And you know, they convinced me to sort of take take that up. And and I said, well, how much training is that? And they said, well, it's about thirteen months now. And I was like, fuck, like that's proper. Um, and so yeah, you know, I signed signed up, um, went through all the sort of pre-selection stuff and you know trying to get in and 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 get selected for for the young officer batch for 2001 um managed to get that with a start date in first of september 2001 and then i spent i spent the summer working as a beach lifeguard in croyd sort of waiting waiting for that to happen with uh and that that was that was good fun all on its own and then and then yeah, rocked up at rocked up at Limston Commando Training Center on the first of first of September two thousand and one, as a as a young officer of how old was I? Twenty, I turned up there as a twenty year old. So it was yeah, it was a good time. That's a pretty good age though. I was working in the uh, core colonel's office, uh, and their whole their whole job is you know is about recruiting and uh, putting the presence out there, whether it's dropping rugby balls off at a rugby match or footballs or you know just basically showing face of the, of the Royal Marines out there um, and uh, we used to have uh, I think they were called military prep schools that used to come through uh, you're talking like 14 15 16 year old kids that was sort of like at the end of the, the, the latter end of what was then GCSEs or the end of education and they'd come through and um, you know, we take them on the uh, bottom field, so the assault course down there. We take them up onto one of the commando test areas, uh, do the endurance course. Um, uh, and then, you know, at the end, they'd have a bit of a, a, a Q&A. And they'd ask, you know, you know, when can I join? What age can I join? And all, and all this sort of thing. And I'd always say to them, look, you can join at the age of 16 if you want to, 16, 17. But what I would really recommend that you do is between 16 and let's say 20 you go away you go and have a bit of life experience you go and get a girlfriend boyfriend whatever it is these days um you know you you go traveling you go and meet people you go and get a job and you go and do all of that and you go and you know learn some life skills first and then come back and then at that age if you really think that you know joining the royal marines or joining joining the military is for you then you go and do it because I was, I was, I did my uh, potential Royal Marines course at 17 and I joined up um, at 18 years old. And I'd had from, you know, ditching a year of my A-level, so I never completed them, to doing about six months of laboring on, on, on a building site. And then I joined up. So literally I'd probably had like nine to 10 months I went traveling a little bit. I went to New Zealand and Australia, you know, jumped in the water, did a bit of surfing around Newcastle and uh, and the Christchurch area in New Zealand as well. Um, but then when I joined up, I really didn't have any life skills, really. I, I had never had really a, a long-term girlfriend or a relationship before. So, you know, women were uh, an enigma to me, to be honest with you. So th there was quite a lot that I hadn't, I hadn't really experienced. And then to go from that to being, you know, being shouted and screamed at and not knowing my ass from my elbow half the time, I literally just fucking survived the whole of recruit training. And I still didn't know like what I was doing four years later either. So um, I think when you join up as a 20 year old, you've got that little bit more confidence with you and, you know, probably held you in a, a better stead than it probably did me. Yeah, I, I I agree definitely. I mean, it's 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 definitely worthwhile getting a little bit of little bit of life experience before turning up to to Limston. Um, I mean, if you haven't 
<laughs> if you don't know who you are yet, by the time you're at, you you rock up to Limston, they're going to break your will to live. Um, but you know, at the same time, I think I think for for officers, for young officers, I mean, even though I sort of got in very young, I was a I was a non grad. I was one of you know in my in my batch, I was one of only three or four non grads, and so. I hadn't been to university. So the majority of the guys turning up were sort of 23, 24 coming out of uni and then, and then going in and, and joining. And I, yeah, I, I think, you know, youngsters, 19, 20, 21, sort of going out and joining units as, as troop commanders and being in charge of, you know, 30, 40 young bootnecks is, I, I don't think it's, it's right. I think, you know, that they need to find an alternative way to that. I mean, I, I think even, even sort of direct commissions, you know, and it's controversial, but I, I don't, I don't agree with it. You know, having gone through the system, having had the honor of, of commanding bootnecks, you know, within units and, and, and deploying with them as a young officer, as a young troop commander, you know, I, 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 I think, I think a much better system would be everybody joins up as a, as a recruit, everybody joins, you know, leaves Limston as a Marine and they do their two years, three years. And at the point where, you know, they are being picked up for junior command course or young officer training, I think at the same time. And, and, you know, they, they decide where they go from there, but I think your young officers should have at least two or three years, you know, in a troop, you know, learning and, and getting their skills and figuring out the system and being mentored and being looked after and, you know, actually getting some proper experience under them before they step up and start commanding. You know, the, the level of young officer training at, at Limston is insane. And what they take you through in 13, 14 months there is absolutely world-class. And the instructors that they have, you know, handpicked some of the best, you know, senior NCOs in the core to take the young officers from, you know, some knobber turning up at the gates on day one who thinks he fucking knows it all because he's just come out of uni to someone ready to, you know, command 30 bootnecks, you know, in a war zone is, you know, is a pretty serious ask, you know, and in... 13 months they they do a hell of a lot and they prep the guys a lot and what they what they put the officers through is is insane but i i i personally think it's it's unfair to the units that those young officers are joining that they're given that level of responsibility and you know the senior ncos will say well you know the troop sergeant does all the work and he he makes the calls anyway you know the young officer just gets the wets in but you know it's it's still i, I think it would be a much better system if those young officers, those, you know, those second lieutenants were, you know, had two, three years experience in a, in a fire team, in a section, you know, being coached by, by a corporal and then being handpicked for young officer training. So, you know, the system does exist. You get the core commission guys. I think core commission is, is the way to go. And, and that's coming from me who, you know, I had the honor of, of, being there and doing it and i got given my first troop when i was 20 years old um and you know we we were we were on the ground in iraq invading iraq at my 21st birthday which i i think was was fucking crazy but yeah that's that's my my controversial view on on sort of commissions and the core yeah i think you're right on the flip side of it i think that you cut you can't really do that sort of thing, especially in the in the Marines and the Navy at the moment, especially with naval manning and, and stuff. It's it's pretty much the same, probably probably worse towards like the, the Afghan period, purely for the fact that everyone had joined up to go away and fight the Afghanis or the Taliban and then they come back and they've done their bit, you know, they've been in a firefight or a situation that they're not really comfortable with and uh, and left. Um, I mean, we we are quite lucky in the fact that we joined up at a time where, you know, the Twin Towers happened and, um, you know, I did up Jakarta, went straight onto Talek and then did Herrick 5, Herrick 12. So I, I did quite a lot of kinetic stuff in, in sort of like the, the first 12 years of my, my career and literally like, you know, the same as you, um, you know, in 2003 went out on 
on the invasion of uh, and the invasion of Iraq. I'd, you know, I'd been out of training like two years. I'd I'd been to two units already. Um, I was still a mega sprog. I still didn't really know what I was doing with my life, and I was probably the unfittest person in all the troops that I'd been in. I was like the troop handbrake all the time. Um, but yeah, but like you say, I think it's a steep learning curve, isn't it? And if you don't embrace that steep learning curve, then you then you're going to suffer sig significantly. But I think, you know, my, my point being is that because we were put into that war situation at a young age, it makes you grow up really quickly. Oh, big time. Yeah. I mean, the the learning curve is is absolutely insane. I mean, just, you know, the the quality of of the instructors and the process at at Limston at the commando training center is insane world class you know what what they can produce from you know a, a recruit turning up on day one to a recruit passing out with his with his green beret and joining a unit is is insane and that's in something ridiculously short like 40 weeks you know and you know th those guys are ready to ready to deploy and then you know your young officers going through there in a year you know in one year what they can turn around from a youngster to being confident and ready to stand in front of 30 bootnecks and and lead them into you know into operational deployments i mean you just it, it just shows you the the level of quality that they you know what they're doing at at the commando training center and what they're capable of um but yeah, the, the age thing is the age thing is tough. You know, you you don't want to delay people coming in because they could end up going and following some different career path. So we want to get them in as as young and early as possible. And I mean, the destructive level of pain and misery that you go through and put your body through at Limston, you know, you leave that too long and your body's just not going to withstand it. So, you know, you've got to get got to get in there as young as as young as possible. Yeah, I think it took me about four years to recover in the end. <laughs> like, it, took me, it took me a long time. Um, yeah. How was your whole experience of, of, of being in the Corps? You know, you did a couple of operational tours, Norway, you went to Diego Garcia as well. I don't think we're supposed to say Diego Garcia, but we're saying it anyway. Yeah, um, you know, you know, how was that whole experience for you? Yeah, I I loved it. Eh? I mean, I I kind of I was really really lucky as a as a as an officer. You know, normally the the career route and the career path of of an officer in in the corps is you you spend your 13, 14 months at Limston preparing to, you know, lead bootnecks into battle and, and, you know, do kinetic operations and, you know, lead small teams around and you, you spend your entire time doing that. You get to a unit as a second lieutenant, you get given, you know, a troop, you, you get to command a troop and you, and you get to do that for one year and then you're off and then someone else comes in behind you and you then, a lot of the time we'll move into some administrative job as a as an officer and you'll get a desk and you'll run admin and and push papers unfortunately until your your next sort of decent job two or three years later and i was quite lucky because i joined up young and you know i i was commissioned at 19 and because i was a non-grad i didn't when everyone else got promoted to captain after one year um, I didn't get promoted. I think I, I got promoted to lieutenant, and therefore I got to stay on at at the unit when everyone buggered off into desk jobs. And I got to I got to stay on for a second year of troop command, which was absolutely uh, amazing. I was I was super lucky. Um, you know, when when we first got to pick after after Limston, we first got to pick. You know, you you get to pick three three top choices where you want to go as a unit and all my choices were down south i just wanted to stay down south because that's where the surf was and that's where it was a little bit warmer and well i was the, the definition of a southerner and i think just to fuck me off they sent me up to four or five and i was gutted I absolutely gutted that they, they were sending me to 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 scotland for my first deployment and I got there and I couldn't understand anything anyone was saying. <laughs> I had a troop of jocks and Geordies that I had to get them, I had to get them to write shit down. I had no idea what they were saying. And 
but you know i i loved it i like the four five commando at the time was epic unit they'd all just got back from Opticana. they were all hard as fuck and you were just going rogue up in scotland did whatever they wanted it was it was such a great unit to join um so you know learned so much there and uh, yeah, I had a fantastic two years with with them. My, my first deployment with with uh, with four five, you know, my first two years with them was was amazing. I had a good troop of guys, great um, great company commander, really good senior NCOs up there. I was, I was super lucky. We, what company are you in? I was in Yankee. Okay, yeah, I was in that uh, company. Yeah, I was I was in Yankee first. We did. Do you remember the? Um, the firefighting um, bloody deployments. Well, we, we used we to call it, it was up fresco, wasn't it? But we call it up fiasco. Up up fiasco. So that was that was the very first thing I did joining. I couldn't believe it. You know, finished finished a year ago through survived commander training center. You know, joined the unit ready to deploy to war and ended up fucking firefighting because those. <laughs> those wankers wanted to go on strike yeah but it, that was actually an amazing experience i like i couldn't believe I was, at at one point i was like i've picked the wrong career firefighting is epic sit around play playstation all day and then fight fires at night it's great um and then you know we came straight off fiasco and you know started started rolling up for for iraq and started prepping for for that and started deploying and and we went over there and sat in kuwait for a few weeks and and then did did the invasion in 2003 and yeah, while while sat in the desert, I I turned twenty one, waiting waiting to invade Iraq, which is a pretty special place to be for my twenty first. And we rolled through that, got back got back to four five, and then started preparing for Northern Ireland. We four five actually did the last op banner tour for 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 bootnecks, which yeah. was which was pretty pretty special after you know the history that that the bootnecks had had there, and you know what the Royal Marines had achieved over in Northern Ireland, and yeah, I mean the the beat up for that and the training for that and the deployment was was really good, and then yeah, you know, after my two years at at four five, it you know they uh, wanted to know where where I wanted to go next, and I was just desperate to avoid a desk job. All I I just needed something. There was no way I was going to get back to a unit. There was no way I was going to get a get another troop. And um, you know the elusive Diego. Garcia draft was uh, was thrown out there, and because I was single at the time, and very few, very few sort of young officers at the time were single. I was I was single, and they're like, "Well, you want to go to an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean for twelve months?" I was like, "Fuck yes, I do," and got my papers signed, and and off I went, and you know, flew out, flew out to Singapore, and then into Diego Garcia, and uh, and and set up shop there as the um sort of royal marines troop commander for for the island which was fantastic did you manage to get any waves around the island because i know you're not allowed to surf around there are you but you know there's a there's a there's a few little spots around there that uh, I, I have been told of um but then again you know indo and sri lanka and those sort of places they're only a hop skip and a jump from diego as well yeah no there's there's waves there there's there's waves actually like so Diego Garcia is shaped like a like a horseshoe, and the the sort of main base, the 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 main naval base, the living areas, you know, where where we operate is all up in the sort of northwestern, the northwestern tip of of the island, and um, there was a good little left hand point right off right off that tip, and a few of the guys surfed, um, you know, a few of the the U.S. sort of naval divers. There are a few surfers there, a few surfers from from our pack as well. We used to surf that little point, um, but the the island was super exposed. So you know, unless the conditions were absolutely perfect, you know, it it was it was always pretty crazy and pretty wild. But then on the other side of the island as well, there were a few nice little point breaks. And the boys, we the the team there had uh, quite a few. The, I think we had four ribs for for doing doing deployments and and doing maritime um interdiction and you know different different sort of maritime operations around there on these ribs and they they used to do sort of weekly patrols you know around and and go and patrol down the coast of the island and just patrol around there do different exercises and you know on a few occasions the waves were up and 
I used to take my, my surfboard in the rib with us. And then I'd, I'd just jump off the side of the rib, go catch some waves. And then on their way back, they'd pick me up and then come back in. And yeah, it was good. It was, it was an amazing, amazing time for sports, actually, just water sports. We were fishing, guys were diving. We were into our kiteboarding as well. I mean, it was a, it was a phenomenal part of the part of the world to be based for for 12 months you know getting getting to work and 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 be in the core and still be out in a place like that it was a amazing experience I'll, I'll never forget for sure yeah it's part of me kind of wishes i'd volunteer to to go and uh to go over there but i'm uh, i'm i've developed into a bit of a homebody now so uh, you know, since I got married in 2007, I hope I've got that right. 2007. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, yeah, so you, you've always got to think about, about the other person as well. And, you know, the, the, there's friends of mine that I know that have got wives and kids, you know, they go away for six months to, to 12 months and they stay back here in the married quarters and stuff. And I'm like, but I don't know, I don't, I don't know whether I could do that or not. Cause it, you know, it, it, it's a massive sea for somebody else to, to to be on their own or you know look after um, look after your own children i'm saying that as if it, like it's a chore but you know what i'm saying oh no a hundred percent i mean i was I, I spent my entire career as a as a single guy so you know i was always chasing the next deployment and and you know frothing for for the next you know next time to get out and 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 deploy or, or the next decent trip like that and so diego was you know, legendary. It was absolutely amazing to get out there with a, a small small team of bootnecks and and run you know r r run the team out there. Um, all the stuff that we were getting involved in out there and and work, working with the Americans. Uh, we had some great training out there and different training deployments. Um, got to work with some amazing amazing people and yeah, it was a really really good time out in Diego. I like I say, we kind of mirrored each other's careers to a certain extent to the point when you left you know you you're at four or five so was i and um you know you went you went to iraq and you did the norway uh before herrick five as well and you, you deployed with with four or five commando on herrick five i deployed with four two commando so i got drafted from there down there so um it, it's quite it's quite weird and i always find that there are people that run in linear motions to you within your career but you never really meet them um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you're one of those people as well. Um, yeah. Won't talk about Norway too much, but how did you uh, help find the whole Herrick Five first major kinetic sort of activity that the core or the British military has done really since the Falklands? Yeah, Her Herrick was was interesting. Um, I mean, we, yeah, it was it was a strange one for us. I mean, I after Diego, I went back to four five and and I took on. I went and did my tanks course and I took on um, OCMSG, which is the maneuver support group. Yep. So th they had created this, this great new unit within, within the, 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 the larger units. And it was almost a, a company size made up of, you know, anti-tankers, machine gunners, um, snipers, you know, it was this epic uh, concept that they had where you could deploy this, you know, heavy weapons troop to then sort of provide overwatch or provide move, maneuver while, you know, the, the the lighter troops could then sort of move into position. There's this great concept that they had sort of been designing and it was, you know, called the, the maneuver support group. And, and our whole plan, the whole beat up to, you know, previous exercises and deployments is, you know, that's how we were going to, you know, go to war. That's how we were going to move. It was going to be vehicle based. It was going to be heavy weapons based. We we're going to, you know, dominate large areas with, with heavy weapons and anti-tank um, technology. And, you know, six months before sort of Herrick came up, you know, the decision was even, even more sort of the decision was they made that one of the commando units on the three commander deployment was going to end up, doing mentoring and and training and embedding teams with with the Afghan army and you know four or five got pulled you know to do that and you know we then got, got completely reorged and the entire unit got reorged to to do that and, and we had to then sort of adapt on how we were operating and had to sort of break down into much smaller teams little six-man teams to then be able to 
train and guide and mentor, you know, a six man bootneck team would mentor and deploy on operations with a company size Afghan national army uh, unit. So, you know, we, we then did that in, in Sangin and, you know, spent, spent a lot of the time in the deployment sort of living in a base um, with the Afghans. And, you know, it was a pretty amazing experience working in a, in a very, very small team of bootnecks, like specialist bootnecks, really, really good guys. Um, and then each of them, you know, would, would mentor the different leaders and the different commanders, you know, from, from the local, local unit. And then we deploy on operations with them and, and, and do a lot of, lot of stuff sort of side by side with them, you know, supporting them, teaching them, helping them, guiding them and, and, you know, be able to bring in some air support for their operations as well. And so it was a, it was an eye opener, you know, something we, we really hadn't done before and, and something, you know, uniquely possible, I think by small, small teams of bootnecks and, and what they were capable of, you know, it, at the beginning of the deployment, we were a bit gutted that we weren't going to be able to operate as a, as a large fighting force, you know, like four, two and, and what 40 were doing. And, you know, we, we were, a bit upset that we were sort of missing out on that and you know but once we sort of understood you know the impact we were making and and got to sort of build those relationships with the afghans and live with them and work with them and and really embed ourselves it was a pretty crazy experience it was it, it was it was really enjoyable and, and definitely something i'll remember forever and that's it in a couple of weeks time you will receive part two of the podcast with dan thornton thanks for listening 